Woo! We get plugged in. And I guess take my mask off. How y'all doing this morning? Yeah, I got up at 5.30 to make sure that I could pound a French press and a half. So, I, you know, I commit. Never let it be said that I don't uh, commit hard. One of these plugs is weird because it's an M1. It's an M1 plug? Yeah. All right, I am plugged in. I don't see my slides yet. Okay. Whoop. Now we're full screen. Woo. Good morning, y'all. Uh, welcome to DevOps Days Seattle. I am extremely excited to be keynoting this because um, a bunch of you probably know who I am. Most of you probably don't, but I've never keynoted a conference before. So uh, not is being true configuration management, but the fact remains that we used these tools to automate configuration of machines and environments before we had more sophisticated tools to do more of the work for us, and so they're included here. But the oldest open source example of modern definition for configuration management, I think just configuration management in general, open source or otherwise, is CF Engine. This was originally released in 1993. It was built by a man named Mark Burgess, who I have been told and didn't have time to add a slide with the photo, though I looked it up, has often been jokingly referred to as the best looking man in configuration management due to a very Steve Jobs-esque photo. Um, it's, it's kind of funny, it's kind of funny. I see where the joke comes from. But uh, he was working on his postdoc in theoretical physics at the University of Oslo in the 90s, and he was tasked with maintaining a series of Unix workstations. They were all running different flavors of Unix. They were all had different platforms to deal with. And this was extremely time consuming. It involved a lot of scripting. It involved a lot of one-on-one -on -one user support. Like nothing could be used on one machine and then another. And it was just, it was a huge amount of work. So instead, he decided to abstract away the differences between all of these machines behind a domain specific language and simplify the management of that whole fleet. Uh, from there, CF Engine 1 was born. It was released in 1993, like the slide says, and kind of just took off from there. Uh, it was very popular. I, I cannot overstate how revolutionary this was. In 1998, it got a little bit of a rewrite as CF Engine 2, and its last release was CF Engine 3, which was nearly a complete rewrite in 1998. Um, this is absolutely the earliest fully formed origin of configuration management tools. And some of you in the crowd have probably used it. I haven't, but somebody has. It's not that far gone. So why does infrastructure as code feel so new if configuration management is so old? Did we just not care about it much until now? Did the complexity that made configuration management useful not exist outside of like academia and big enterprises? No, but like many advancements in technology, a need to handle greater and greater complexity at scale is what's driven the evolution of and adoption of infrastructure as code. It wouldn't, nothing would leap the way it does without a need to make things more complex, make things faster, make things bigger. Prior to the ubiquity of cloud computing, provisioning computing resources meant just acquiring new physical infrastructure, right? whether that was going to buy stuff and building it yourself or calling up your local data center or rack space or whatever to add another server rental to your account. It wasn't what we do today at all. Utility computing or the like pay for what you use model that most cloud providers use today, that wasn't really a thing yet. So scaling to infinity wasn't as easy as it is today. It wasn't really possible for a lot of companies, um, the only ones who really needed to scale that big were like huge multinational corporations and they had like the resources, the money, the people to handle that. Average small business super did not. So it just like wasn't really a thing, a question that most people had to answer. But the threshold for what constitutes at scale changes over time. That's not a constant. We keep changing what at scale means. And in 2006, AWS released the first version of EC2. So within a pretty short period of time, uh, scalability was suddenly like everybody's problem. 
Okay, EC2 and the popularity of utility computing made it easy for small businesses to take up and use and pay for the exact amount of resources they needed and they could just add more at the drop of a hat. It wasn't like a huge production anymore. And unfortunately, tools for managing that infrastructure hadn't really kept up. So they weren't built for like this type of complexity. They weren't built for this type of scale. They weren't built for this environment. And with all of that infrastructure by necessity being created manually, growth and scalability were hampered. Provisioning and managing instructions for potentially hundreds of servers by hand is really, really slow and honestly not that reliable. I find an excuse to say this in like nearly every talk I give, but humans are so, so bad at repetitive tasks. We just are not good at it. We can't be relied upon. We have bad days. We get tired. Like maybe you, uh, I don't know, somebody cut you off in traffic and now you're cranky at work and you're going to make a mistake, right? And that's understandable. It's normal. Nobody should ever get in trouble for that no matter how long prod is down. The individual should not get in trouble for that. Computers don't make those mistakes, right? Like you tell a computer what to do and it is going to do that thing exactly as you defined it and hopefully you defined it correctly, right? We can't like be at 100% all the time in that same way. So we shouldn't be responsible for repetitive actions like manually configuring network infrastructure or whatever. This also introduces another problem. With no reproducible definition of what your infrastructure looks like, you have no idea what your environment looks like now relative to when it was first stood up, stood up right? And even worse, you may not know what it's supposed to look like because what if the person who stood it up manually didn't document what they did and then left the company. You have no idea. And a ton of companies as a result of like this era, they still have like random manually created environments just like hanging around in the ether costing them money, which is one way that like Corey Quinn's company uh, makes money. Um, but like this is, this is a thing, right? And this, this lack of visibility can be a massive problem. It can be a security risk and it can be expensive and it's frankly like not very DevOps. So the problems brought on by that huge jump in complexity allowed by the rise of EC2 led to the introduction of a whole new class of tools for configuring and managing your infrastructure. This is the point in the history lesson where I'm gonna be talking about tools most of you have heard of and many of you have used. I know some of you in the crowd have worked on or for all three of the products I'm about to mention and um, please forgive me for not doing a deep dive on the differences between them. I've only used one of them and I don't wanna participate in the like back and forth over who's better. So I'm staying very neutral on every tool I'm gonna to mention in this talk. Anyway, in 2005, we got Puppet. Uh, Puppet is a software configuration management system that relies on its own domain specific language to define like resources and state for a system in the form of files called Puppet Manifests. It accomplished a lot of the same goals CF Engine did, although in a different language and from like digging and looking at both of them, the learning curve on Puppet is considerably less steep than the learning curve for CF Engine. Um, it did have a Ruby DSL available, by the way, but it was never widely adopted, apparently, and it was removed in 2018, so unfortunate. In 2009, we get Chef, and unlike Puppet, Chef was built around that Ruby DSL. While this means that you have access to a language that's like pretty close to full-fledged Ruby, it can be a little bit less friendly for folks who came from an ops background instead of from a programming background. So for a lot of people, like the choice between these two, at least of the people I polled, came down to a question of, like, are you more comfortable writing configuration files or do you want something that looks more like a program? Just like what is your background? And in 2012, Ansible was released. Three years later, it got acquired by Red Hat. I know there's at least one person in the room who used to work for Red Hat on Ansible. There's another one back there, one right there. <laughs> like CF Engine and Puppet, it uses a declarative domain specific language. Unlike CF Engine, Puppet, and Chef, however, uh, Ansible is agentless, so there's no piece of Ansible uh, installed or running on the machine it is controlling. 
Uh, instead, it works via a temporary SSH connection, which is honestly pretty cool. And this was my first configuration management tool. This is the, the one I learned on um, like eight years ago. So these tools dominated the market for years, and they still remain in use today, but we tend to think of them mostly as configuration management tools, even though they do some of the same jobs as modern infrastructure as code tools. They can provision infrastructure on a cloud provider in a code-like way, so what's, what's the difference? Where is the line between configuration management and infrastructure as code? Honestly, uh, I went digging for an answer to this, and uh, it was all over the place. Initially, I wanted to say that the difference between, it, it's the difference between managing resources and state for an application rather than for an entire machine, and that's not actually entirely clear. Um, tools for configuring machines and operating systems rather than just applications absolutely do exist in classes of their own under the umbrella of configuration management. So. Instead, my opinion is this. Uh, configuration management can and does exist on its own, as some of the tools that I've already mentioned, they do just market themselves as config management. But it also exists as a greater part of the concept of infrastructure as code. And infrastructure as code wouldn't be what it is without configuration management. Maybe it's more accurate to say that infrastructure as code is the natural evolution of configuration management. Um, that's also an argument I'm willing to have later. But still, how did we make that leap? Also, I need some water. Mm. Canned water. So the growing popularity of maintainer technologies and Docker's introduction in 2013 once again causes complexity to become a huge problem. Uh, it allowed for much more sophisticated solutions and architectures, but caused new pain points and then aggravated some like kind of sore spots that we've been ignoring until now. We did have containers before Docker, to be clear, like that they, they were not like groundbreaking in the invention of containers, but um, Docker's relative ease of use, its lightweight, and especially the ability to like share container images in a centralized public or private repository <coughs> was pretty revolutionary, and it really heavily can contributed to its popularity. Uh, this was also right around the time, like two years after the introduction of the concept of microservices, and right at like microservices really being able to take off, which was a design paradigm that Docker is really, really well suited to handling. Um, just as an aside, between Docker Compose and Docker files themselves, I think you could argue that Docker is itself a kind of infrastructure as code tool, just a self-contained one. Like, it's, it's obviously doing much more than that, right? But you are describing a machine, its state, and its resources with something that looks like code. Um, I'm not married to that argument at all, but um, it's definitely something to think about it. I'm not gonna count it for the purposes of this talk, but, you know, anyway. The rapid adoption of applications built out of lots and lots of containers necessitates the creation of some kind of tool to manage groups of them. Thus, container orchestration becomes a thing. Um, many of you will be familiar, at least vaguely, with these tools too. Obviously, the most popular one is Kubernetes, but we've also got Docker Swarm and Mesos and Nomad and a whole bunch of other stuff built on top of Kubernetes like OpenShift. Um, Kubernetes does come with its own set of issues, right? It's complex, but when you really need to scale some kind of containerized application, there's, it's kind of hard to beat, something like it. I know a ton of people have opinions here from Kubernetes is great and you should always like plan for future growth, use it from day one, and some people think Kubernetes is unnecessary 99% of the time. I'm not here to have that argument, but <coughs> It is a thing, right? I acknowledge that. Fun aside, uh, on this logo that's up here, you'll notice that it has seven spokes. A ship's wheel typically has eight spokes, not seven. The reason it has seven spokes is a nod to the original name of the project. Uh, Kubernetes was born out of Google's Borg, which is uh, an internal version of that, and when Kubernetes was first being pitched as an open source thing, they wanted to name it seven of nine. 
So hence the seven spokes on the Kubernetes logo. Yeah, now you know. <laughs> So the adoption of Kubernetes leads cloud providers to introduce a bunch of different ways to deploy it. Every major cloud provider has at least one way to do this. Uh, running Kubernetes on-prem becomes a thing, and suddenly we need smarter tools that are actually built for this type of work. So in 2014, the same year Kubernetes is introduced, Terraform launches. Uh, I know that I work for a Terraform competitor. I I'm not going to say anything negative about Terraform because that's rude. So. Um, we are all in this together, so I'm not going to talk trash about them. Like most of its predecessors, it is capable of both provisioning infrastructure and configuration management. It also uses a domain-specific language. But unlike its predecessors, it was designed to primarily concern itself with the management of your infrastructure lifecycle, which is now much more complicated and much more difficult to handle than it has ever been. Terraform becomes wildly popular and continues to be popular as a result of its big community and broad support for clouds and other tools. Most of you have probably used this directly, and all of you know what it is. So Kubernetes matures. Uh, more and more things are built on top of it or extend it. AWS introduces a 17th way to deploy Kubernetes. Uh, Corey Quinn schedules a weekly tweet to make a joke about that. I build a whole career out of screeching on Twitter about the deprecation of support for technologies I have mentioned in this very talk, and complexity becomes an issue again. There's a pattern here. So we've come a very, very long way so far, and each of the tools I've mentioned so far has its strengths, usually reflected by the time and circumstance in which that tool was built, but at this point in history, ops teams and SREs are left with a kind of like maybe outsized quantity of work. And when engineers do want to get involved or they have to get involved, a lot of times they're given tools that use DSLs they don't know, and they increasingly face situations that would benefit from the expressiveness of a programming language. The rise of DevOps means that we should be striving to like close this gap, right? We should be looking for like a more equitable distribution of work between the ops team and the dev team instead of just like throwing stuff at each other, right? That's, that's the ultimate goal, am I wrong? That's what we want, right? So in 2017, Pulumi is released. Yes, I work at Pulumi. No, I'm not gonna do a sales pitch. Uh, Pulumi takes a different approach to infrastructure's code than the tools that came before it. Instead of using a DSL, we instead chose to focus on providing access to infrastructure as code using like a general use programming language. So rather than writing like something that looks like YAML or JSON, you can you write Python or whatever. This expressiveness allows those managing infrastructure a little bit more fine-grained control over what's going on with their resources, and it increases ease of use for those specifically who prefer to come at things from a programming perspective, right? So we still have the same like paradigm issue that happened between like Puppet and Chef, where one is programming language focused and the other one is more like Opsy. Two years later, in 2019, AWS releases their own cloud development kit, CDK, which takes a very similar programming focused approach to configuring resources and infrastructure for its own suite of services. The other IAC tools that the other clouds have and Google and AWS does have CloudFormation. Those all pretty much look like YAML. CloudFormation also allows you to use generally used programming languages like Python or Go, which for me is neat because I was an engineer and I'm not comfortable writing a whole lot of YAML. Um, and this, this brings us pretty close today product-wise. At this point, every major cloud provider has some native way to handle their infrastructure and Almost every tool I've mentioned today, actually all of them aside from CDK, are cloud agnostic. So you can use any of these to interact with any of the current cloud providers. You've got a wealth of options to figure out what you want to do. And this is the whole timeline from the origin of the first functional example of some kind of configuration management to today. And each step along this tooling timeline has gotten us closer to the DevOps ideal, even before we had a name for what we're talking about at this very 
conference. It's been like, what, a little bit more than a decade since DevOps Days Ghent? 11 years, 12, right? 11 years. So well before the word DevOps was a thing, we had all of this stuff that was trying to get us there, right? I have skipped over some, stool, some tools here for simplicity's sake because they're like very, very close to the ones mentioned here and maybe less popular and not weird enough in the timeline to, to make sense like Nix um, and SaltStack. Uh, though I do love Nix, I will say. But suffice it to say that the most detailed timeline of the evolution from make files to full-fledged IIC is much longer than this slide. Like there's no way I could cram it on here and have it still be readable. So infrastructure in co as code feels very shiny and new, right? But like most things in computing, it's actually super old. We're just coming at the same problems from different angles to work around the circumstances of the day and occasionally abstracting away a problem that still exists that we solved earlier. Like at this point, we are, we are several abstractions away from stuff like make files and stuff like CF Engine, but those problems do still exist. We've just abstracted them away to focus on dealing with the thing that now bothers us. So even if you've been around since make files first allowed us to simplify configuring resources and applications, it's easy to take for granted how far we've come and how much this stuff has changed. For me, having this context makes it easier to understand the tools of the day. If I understand the pain points that led to the things that came before it, then a newer thing is more intuitively graspable, right? So I hope that y'all enjoyed this talk. I hope you learned something. If you didn't learn anything because you were around for all of this, that's okay too. I hope it was at least a nice walk down memory lane, um, but I do really hope that you learned something or at least you thought I was entertaining, right? <laughs> It's kind of wild doing the research for talks like this and discovering for myself the details of like how old some of this stuff truly is. Like I, uh, I didn't realize just how old CF Engine was. I didn't realize like some of the like interim tools and concepts that existed between like make files and CF Engine. Um, so it's it's always kind of weird to to research. It also always makes me wonder. At what point is this thing that feels shiny and new to us now, IAC, gonna feel as antiquated as something like CF Engine? What on earth is this gonna look like in another 30 years, right? So I'm, I'm pretty pumped to find out what it's gonna look like in another 30 years. But uh, if you have an idea for um, another class of tool you'd like to hear a history lesson on, let me know and I'll do my best. But again, if you'd like to get a hold of me, there's my Twitter, there's my email. And I can take some questions now. Anybody? <laughs> Got like five minutes, right? Uh, yeah, uh, I don't know. <laughs> Does anybody have any questions? No. Somebody's got a question over there. What's up? Hold on. <laughs> oh, yeah, need a mic. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, so a lot of the definition of how things work in this space goes from definition to how it's instantiated in the cloud or servers, et cetera. Yeah. We talked about Drift, or how does the other way look in this world throughout the tools? Meaning something has changed in the instantiation, is it re can it be reflected back in the definition? So that's actually like a super hard problem to solve, unfortunately. Um, configuration drift is an issue that like a, a ton of IAC providers um, struggle with solving in a way that's uh, useful and accurate without becoming overwhelming. Um, and I think there are like entire there are entire talks on handling configuration drift specifically, but um, if you email me, or I would prefer you send me a Twitter DM, um, I will send you a link to a good um, blog article on handling config drift specifically. Hi. Hi. Hi, thank you. Uh, 
What's your, what's your opinion on using infrastructure as code for code deployments? For deployments? Yeah. I mean, I do it. Uh, yeah. yeah, like, yeah, hard yes. Hard, hard yes. yes. Hard yes, do it. Got yes. It. Uh, the, the fewer things that you have to do manually that you can, like, automate within a <laughs> workflow that doesn't require, like, poking at more stuff or introducing, like, a ton more tools, yes, do that. Do that, absolutely. Hard yes. One back there, uh, back right. Run, 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 run. <laughs> Thank you. Oh, that microphone is so cute. Can I just say? So uh, that was an awesome talk. Thank you so much. Thank you. Um, CMake was like what seventy, so fifty years yeah. ago. Yeah. So what's the next fifty years look like? I or maybe the next ten. <laughs> I don't know. I have no idea. I have no idea. And it's like it's mind-boggling to think about because like I'm sure that like CMake seemed revolutionary right like everybody probably blew everybody's socks off and now we're like oh yeah this is kind of like boring and um inconvenient and it sucks and we only use it for like really 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 minor like clean readable things unless you are uh still working in embedded linux um, which i fortunately am not so um i i don't know like everything today feels very automated to me so I'm looking forward to seeing what it turns out, but I'm not creative or imaginative enough to like even guess at what things might look at 10 years from now. Ooh, spicy. <laughs> I think that's it, unless there's one more question. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs>